Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC310, a class on church and ministry administration. Let's take a moment to pray and then we will start. Could one of us uh, in the class please pray? Father, we want to thank you for this morning. God, we humble ourselves in your presence. We pray, God, as we learn from your word today, that your voice would speak to us, and especially regarding uh, our administration. Oh God, we pray that you would help us understand the importance of it and also to work out this in our practical life, Lord God. Uh, we thank you for this time of learning. We humble ourselves once again before your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. So last week we were talking about culture, how um, uh, just kind of uh, set, setting the uh, the understanding of culture, uh, both from an organization perspective, that means there is the culture of an organization. And also, there is culture of the congregation of the church. And um, uh, in this lesson, we are going to focus on the culture of the organization, uh, of the ministry from that side. And uh, the things we learn, of course, can also apply to the culture of the community, the church community of the church organization. It's the same. Our uh, same principles will apply, but our focus is on the culture of the organization. So let me uh, go ahead and share the PDF, uh, and then we can begin our uh, lecture. So uh, just a quickly review. Uh, when we said culture, uh, we're talking about uh, the the environments within in an organization. In the, the uh, in, in of course we're talking about a church ministry or a church organization. We're talking about the culture. So and the culture is shaped by the values, what people hold as important. Uh, are shaped by the practices, the behavior, the the traditions that are observed uh, in that group of people in that organization. So, uh, and culture can change over time. You know, we may start right, but we could end up wrong. You know, we may start with a very nice, happy environment, uh, nice culture, and if we are not careful, um, the culture could become bad. And that you know that I think has happened in a lot of Christian organizations. I think last time I mentioned, you know, um, uh, when you read uh, Christian magazines like uh, Christianity Today or other uh, uh, outlets that report on Christian organizations, and when you read about you know uh, the culture in a certain church or a certain organization where it has gone wrong. We must understand that they didn't start wrong. You know, most, uh, almost, almost, we could say almost every church, every Christian organization started right. They started with, uh, you know, with a, with a very uh, kingdom, Bible based, God fearing, God loving culture, where everybody said, okay, yeah, we want to glorify God. Uh, they want to, you know, follow what God is saying and so on. So everybody started right, uh, but somewhere along the way, inside the organization, things started changing. The culture drifted uh, from, you know, what what the Bible tells us we should maintain, and uh, for various reasons, uh, and uh, then it became very toxic. It became very difficult, hurtful, harmful for the people who are in working in the church or organization. So we have to constantly watch over this whole thing in our work. 
what is the environment like what is the culture like and we have to keep monitoring it just like how we monitor our own health uh, yeah if the temperature is going up you know something is wrong if i'm getting a fever hey something is wrong because it has to be within a normal healthy range and if it goes wrong we have to address it so we said culture and this reviewing what we did last time uh, it affects the organization how people work how people um, you know the productivity can people be free to do what they can uh, how we serve the congregation and also uh, if you have a healthy culture it can protect from negative influences of course there are negative influences from outside but then if you have a healthy culture it tends to self correct you know like just like our body you know we we can uh, you know we can go out we are going out and around us there may be germs and this and that uh, but if it comes near us our body defends our body puts up a defense it's a defense mechanism okay? so like that a healthy culture can help protect uh, the organization and we covered one point last time on what shapes the organization culture uh, and, when I said, and we said this that this is very important which is it starts with the leadership you know leaders at all levels must model the culture that um, we want to see in the organization because people are going to imitate the leaders you know they they're watching and they, they say hey if the leader behaves like this i will also behave like that if the leader does this i will also do this the leader says that is okay i will also say it's okay the leader says not okay we are, you know so you know and i'm not i'm not saying that you know the leader is solely responsible but it is a very important uh, influence the leadership uh, influences the culture and leadership at all levels right because example if there is a team uh, of people and there's a team leader that team leader is the closest point of contact for that team member for those team members you know he's the one who's directly influencing that team so at his level that team leader must you know embody kingdom culture you know, he must demonstrate or he or she must demonstrate at that level okay this is what it means you know uh, and then people around that will follow so um uh, we we need to understand how this is again so important about leadership and uh, some of the things we just mentioned you know we should avoid celebrating culture where people are celebrating the individual you know we're not we're not gathering around the individual we're gathering around the lord jesus christ he is our chief shepherd uh, uh the the leadership uh, should model servant leadership you know, what does it mean to serve what does it mean to go uh, the extra mile uh, to to live sacrificially like we heard earlier this morning uh, so the leadership should model that uh, the leadership should uh, listen to feedback uh, and people should not feel threatened that hey if i give feedback the leader will take revenge you know <laughs> retaliate uh, they should feel like that uh, they should have the understanding that if i give feedback uh, the leadership will listen uh, and you know if uh, if my feedback is valid they will definitely take it into account you know so people should have that opportunity and uh, uh, the leadership should you know uh, let people know that they are welcome to come and talk and share their thoughts and give feedback right? so that's the first but that's not the only thing that's the first thing there are other things that also influence organizational culture and uh, second thing that we will talk about is uh, stories so when we talk about hey this is our journey this is how we started uh, this is how we have journeyed these are the things we have faced in the past and overcome this is in a, in a church context or in a Christian organization context. We can say, you know, this is how God has provided for us. This is uh, these are the things God has helped us do. Um, uh, these are the ways God has worked in our journey. 
So as we share this story, I share these stories. Um, it really inspires people, and they say, "Hey, God can do it again. God can do bigger than the past. He can do greater than the past." And so these stories inspire people, uh, and it, 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 it inspires the behavior, uh, and it inspires, you know, it, it motivates the people, and so. On. So telling and retelling the good stories. Right? I, I'm not talking. I'm not saying we should, you know, talk about all the bad things. No, but the good things, of course, we can talk about the lessons we've learned from mistakes. But they talk about, you know, the, the victories, the way God has led, and the, the way God has helped us navigate difficult situations. It will encourage people, uh, and it will inspire and shape the culture. Also, um, uh, to rituals and practices. That means. Things that we do repeatedly, they shape the thinking and the behavior of people. You know, things that we do repeatedly, uh, practice. So that's what we call as uh, rituals or practices. Things that we do repeatedly, it shapes the thinking and behavior. And I'll just give you know, for example, how do we handle when a staff leaves? Now. Uh, for us at uh, APC, we do have people joining us, new people joining us, and from time to time we also have people leaving us as uh, staff. Now, how do we handle that? It, it will affect the thinking and the behavior of the other people. If so, for, uh, and especially when you think of you know when staff are leaving. It can actually bring the morale down. You know, people be wondering why is that person leaving? Why is that person? Why is that person not staying and working here? Why are they going? But if we celebrate their movement, right? We say, hey, they're going for better things. Uh, they're going for a greater opportunity, and we celebrate it. Then, uh, you know, it shapes the thinking and behavior that it is fine. If people have to leave and they are going to go for something better. Maybe a bigger opportunity, and we are we are celebrating it. We're not; it's not pulling us down. So what we do and what we have been doing is, you know, and and people leave for various reasons. Like this year, uh, one person left because he was going to do higher studies. Uh, he went abroad to do higher studies. Uh, another person just left because you know his family is moving abroad. Um, let's see who else. Uh, so I can at this moment I can think of two people uh, who left. Um, so just as an example, what we always do is on the last day or the day before they leave, we have like a little uh, small farewell. Um, we cut cake, we have snacks, we let them share, talk to talk to everybody about their journey at APC. So for example, a pastor who recently left, he was with us from for almost. Uh, you know, uh, 12, or 12 or 13 years. So that's a long journey he had with us. But now he's moving abroad. So we bless him. We celebrate that transition. We, hey, he's, he's got, you know, he's, God has blessed him and his family with a uh, nice opportunity abroad. So he's going. And we send him with blessing. So then the staff leaving does not become a demoralizing thing on everybody else, but it becomes a celebratory thing that, hey, this person is going for a better opportunity or going for something you know, different. And uh, and so, and this is a ritual and a practice we have all the time. You know, whenever there is, we celebrate the birthdays, we celebrate the uh, special things that are happening, we celebrate the departure, somebody leaving us, they're going for something else. Uh, and um, you know, we celebrate this, this. So like that, these rituals, you know, how how we keep the, these things that we do repeatedly, uh, it shapes thinking of people. Yeah, we should think positive you know, on 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 situations. So that helps shape culture. Um, uh, another thing is uh, orientation and repeatedly communicating the values. Right. So these we, we constantly repeat uh, and we hold people accountable uh, to values. So. Uh, if we find 
somebody deviated from our core value, then I will call them, whoever's responsible, call them and say, hey, you know, this is, we need to stay aligned to this, right? Uh, we need to follow, for example, integrity. If somebody is not, you know, being truthful or honest, call them and say, you know, you're supposed to be truthful, you're supposed to be honest. We have to maintain integrity. So keeping people aligned to the core values helps us make sure the culture is maintained uh, and it's not getting diluted or corrupted uh, by what some people might do. Sometimes they do it unknowingly, sometimes they may know, do it knowingly, and so we have to hold them accountable and get people back. So the constant training, repeating the values helps in maintaining the culture. And also affirming and rewarding behavior that's aligned to the culture. When somebody does something that's aligned to the culture, um, you know, of course, everybody is doing things aligned to the culture, but when somebody goes out of the way to do something very exceptional, mm -hmm. uh, in order to, you know, maintain the culture, then you recognize that you reward it, um, then it affirms that people say, yeah, that's the way I must behave. That's, that's what's important for us as an organization. Uh, you know, and then they, it really strengthens the culture. So these are things that we uh, we, um, we we must be aware of that help us, um, you know, affirm or, or uh, shape the culture within the organization. Now, one thing that helps is to clearly uh, spell out to clearly communicate. What are our values? And what are our values? And then to use those values when you're making decisions, you know, uh, especially within the staff, within the people. So um, we have put this in a little uh, picture like this. And of course, this was done many, many years ago in the early part of our journey. I don't know exactly when we did this, but we put it in a little picture like this. And we said, look, these are our core values. So when it comes to ministry, our theme is Jesus. You know, so that means everything we do should be communicating Jesus. Now, we don't want to talk about APC. We want to talk about Jesus. And so our theme is Jesus. Our content is the word of God. And that's very important. They have to speak, preach, teach from the word of God. The method is Holy Spirit. Yes, we will use a lot of tools, but we are depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. Our passion is people. That means we are focused on building people, helping people, transforming people, people. And then our goal is to help everybody become like Jesus. So this is it. You know, that's what we are doing. And uh, we need to keep affirming this, keep talking about this. Uh, keep emphasizing it. Okay? And we have to monitor that, yeah, you know, in the, in the way we are doing ministry, the way we are going about our work, these core values are maintained. And then surrounding it, uh, practically, there are some other things that are very important for us. Uh, one is we want to give opportunity to, for everybody. Okay? So we don't say, okay, the opportunity is only for, you know, uh, certain kinds of people. So everyone wants, can participate in what's happening in the church. Of course, in certain areas, uh, you know, you, you have certain skills that are required. For example, people who are worship team, they should be able to sing or play some instrument. That's obviously a, a requirement. Uh, so yeah, those those things will be there, and therefore. Uh, you know, there may be some uh, requirements or there may be some, you know, even like auditions that happen. But otherwise, in general, anybody who has that skill, of course, can apply, uh, can, can serve that. If they meet that requirement, they can definitely serve. But the opportunity is open. Second, uh, unity. We want, we want to stay together. So if anything that is disrupting unity, we'll address it. By anybody, if if there is somebody even in the pastoral team, if somebody in the pastoral team is doing something that's disturbing unity, we'll address it. 
uh, if there is somebody in the congregation who's doing something that's disturbing unity, we'll address it. So unity is, a, like I mentioned earlier, integrity or excellence, pioneering. It is trying out new things. It's okay, go ahead, do something new. Uh, maybe it's not done before. It's okay, go ahead, try it out. It's okay to, to fail. You know, it's okay to try it out and then say that, yeah, it didn't work out. That's okay. Yeah, at least we tried. Uh, at least we experimented. We saw what can happen. And, and now, of course, we're thinking. We're not just blindly doing things. Uh, we think, we plan, we research. But we are, uh, we are open to pioneering, to experimenting, to being, to being on uh, the leading edge of things. And also relationships. People, rela relationships with people, these all are very important things. So when we are making decisions, when we're going about our work, we can emphasize these things. Example, uh, there was a time, uh, I would say maybe at least uh, still about two years ago, um, when there used to be mistakes in the PowerPoints, in the, in the, in the projections that happened, you know? And, uh, I used to get very upset, <laughs> but it'll happen in the middle of the service because they're putting the songs up on the screen and then you'll see one spelling mistake. Right? Some word is spelled wrong or uh, some problem with the lyrics or something like that. And one thing I used to do was when I, I will notice it and then I'll send an email on Monday. I'll send it to the media team. Hey, this thing was spelled or the worship team. What was responsible for it? So, hey, I'll give feedback. Constantly, I give feedback. You know, I, I won't just let it go. And it was almost like I was pushing them. Saying, hey, we have to get this right. We have, when we project something on the screen on Sunday, uh, when we are showing some, or, you know, any, for that matter, any service or any event, when we're putting up our lyrics, when we are putting up our, you know, our content, or when you're doing our Sunday video announcements, it has to be perfect. Shouldn't be any mistakes. So kept pushing, kept pushing, and keep giving feedback. And not in a condemning way, but just to highlight, hey, that was a mistake there. You didn't do it. That was not right. So then, you know, and then we try to okay, how do we make sure that, you know, our lyrics are correct? How do we check? How do we double check? Because we want excellence. You know, we don't want uh, people sitting in the congregation, then they're looking up on the screen and, you know, a word is spelled wrong or uh, the lyrics is not, you know, is wrong. It will be, it, it's like, hey, people will feel bad. You know, what, what is this? So we have to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And finally, right, you know, I think, and I'm not, I don't, I can't say we are 100% perfect, but at least we, from what I've seen the last one year or maybe like the recent two years, Things have been fairly good. Like, you know, I don't think I've noticed hardly any mistakes uh, and so on. So, but it took us a while to come to that place. So, constantly pushing. So, like this in every area in our APC books, we are still working on how to make every book free from mistakes. We don't want a single spelling mistake. We don't want a single grammar mistake. We don't want a single, you know, uh, typesetting and sometimes the, the, the typesetting can go wrong. We want everything to be good. We, we have to work at it, work at it. You know? And uh, because when we when we do something, let's try to do it better. Now, I'm not saying we're 100% perfect, but it's part of our culture to keep working towards it, and eventually, you know, we will get there. So, like that, there's so many different things. You know, we can talk about each of these values. Uh, the point is that we should. We have defined our values, we've described it. Now we have to make sure that people are following it. Right? If anything goes out of line, you need to bring them back in like, hey, that decision did not, uh, that decision affected relationship. It, you know, also was that decision the right decision? Because for us, relationship is important. And uh, we don't want to make decisions that are hurting people, disturbing relationships. Uh, we have to think, you know. So 
all these things we can, you know, in practical ways, we can hold people responsible, accountable uh, for these things. So it's good to put down, these are our core values. This is what our, these are things that are important to us. And, um, and so we're going to pursue uh, these, these things in a, in a practical, in a day-to-day way, -day, okay? So we kind of explained this a little bit here. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions here on, on core values and how to practically help maintain culture. Okay. Uh, okay, I see a question in the chat. What if someone leaves for some bitter reasons or because they got offended by something or the past sense of this is from him on some grounds? How will a pastor then explain his departure? Yeah. So this also has happened, right? So uh, let's say I'm talking about our church staff, right? There are times when people have been released because uh, they've not been performing, for example, or maybe they were doing things that were harmful to the culture, where, example, uh, if somebody in our was were affecting relationships, right? They were disturbing relationships, the dynamic in church. They were getting into strife with people. Uh, so those, you know, those, and like this. So this happens. Uh, typically, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a ministry setting, if somebody's not performing, they're not doing their work. Uh, like I had mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, we have a three strike rule that means we give them one warning second warning third warning they still are not performing uh, we'll try to put them in a different role if that doesn't work out still they still don't perform then at some point if they're not performing well we'll have to you know let them go now in such situations and i'll talk about the offended part separately but i'm just talking about this part where we have to remove somebody because of, uh, you know, maybe their performance not good or they're affecting relationship or something like that. In such situations, things are done at a very personal level. That means the only people who know are the people who are involved. So I will have a common example. If I make that decision, I will have a conversation with this person and it would have gone on over a few months, right? It's not something you just wake up one day and dismiss somebody, no. Uh, it's because over, over months we have been talking about their performance, example. And we've been telling them, we've given them feedback, we've helped them maybe change the role, we put them in a different role, they're still not performed. Um, there is some, you know, real proof that they've not been performing. But finally, it comes to a point where we have to let them go. So it'll be a conversation between me and that person, and only the people who need to be involved, which is usually, uh, which will be the HR person and the accountant. So usually, only these people need to know uh, what is happening, right? That this person is being released because of a lack of performance, of course, the HR will be involved. They will know, uh, they will be involved through the process. And uh, the accountant needs to know because we need to settle all the, you know, any outstanding dues or whatever, all those things need to be dealt with. They don't, the accountant doesn't need to know all the reasons, but they need to know that, hey, this person is, is being terminated and their last day will usually be given 30 days notice. So the last day is, 30 days from now, please make sure that all, you know, all the details are taken care of before that. So they need to know. So it's done at a very personal level. And we also do the same thing. The farewell is done. We just bless them. We send them out. But we don't talk about their reasons in public. Right? So we don't, we don't explain uh, the lack of performance, all that. We don't talk about it in the public. We just say, so-and-so uh, is uh, moving on to something else. And hopefully by that time, uh, they'd have got another job or something else, they'd have a plan. And so they talk about what they're going to do next. 
but we don't um, we don't talk about that in public. So only the people who need to know. Sometimes there's another team leader who is involved because maybe they're reporting to somebody else. So that person is involved, I am involved, HR is involved, accountant is informed. Uh, so only those people know. Others will not know. And we don't need to talk about it to other people. The first part of your question, which is uh, if somebody leaves for bitter reasons, they got offended. Now, of course, uh, they will initiate the action. They will come and tell us, I'm leaving because of sunset church. Uh, and then we always handle it with grace. That means, say, fine, you know, uh, we respect your decision. Uh, we will, again, we will not talk about that. We will not discuss that matter in public. It's all kept only between the people who need to know. Uh, because we want to, you know, we, we don't want the negative things. Um, we don't want to talk about that. They may have been offended. There, there may be some misunderstanding and so on. But it's the people who need to know who will be informed. And uh, if it is a very important person, like somebody who's holding responsibility, then I need to inform the pastoral team. Sometimes I have to inform our board of trustees as why this person is leading. It just depends on you know the, the situation. But again, the same thing applies, which is only the people who need to know will be informed. And uh, that's how we handle it. Uh, is that okay? Did I answer your question, Rosalind? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on culture? On uh, Pastor, one question. Yes, go on. In a congregation, which is uh, a multicultural setting, uh, I think it is quite possible that people from same culture spend more time together. Is it okay or um, as a church, do we need to uh, work around anything? I think we mentioned one thing regarding this. I think during signing volunteers, uh, we can combine people from different culture together so that they can gel along. But I'm asking specifically about the congregation. People from same culture uh, tends to stick along together even after the service during fellowship time and all that. Um, so mm -hmm. is, is it okay or uh, should we do anything about it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we have, to, it's a very, very good question. Very good question. We have to look at it from two perspectives. One is uh, people are comfortable uh, being with or among people of their own culture. Right? That's just normal, it's just natural. You know, it's like, um, they tend to move among the same crowd. So that is a positive side, which is, yeah, it is their community. It is their, their it is their safe space. It is their very comfortable place. Uh, so that's a good thing. But the other side is that that will result in formation of uh, what we could say clicks if you're not careful and which will leave other people out so that is the other side the negative side of it so there is a positive side yeah we want people to feel comfortable and and by default we all feel comfortable with people of our own who are like us so that we are comfortable talking to them. It's, it's normal. But the negative side is uh, it, it may result in forming of many, many, many groups. And it also may leave other people out. And this has happened. And it keeps on happening, actually. <laughs> in fact, just I think uh, maybe one, or, one month back, I think, we had to address that. One month back, one or two months back, 
uh, we had to address that with our youths here in Bangalore. Right? We noticed that happening. That you know, of course, we have a good youths, good uh, you know, youths uh, group and all that. But even among the youths, what we started noticing was certain people, certain youths were just spending more time with each other for whatever things, you know. But then that that resulted in this almost like groups from within the bigger group, you know. And we saw that, hey, that's not good. That's not what we want. Yes, we want people to feel comfortable, but we don't want, because then it will leave other people out. And it has happened. Some people will leave. And they say, oh, I, 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 I don't feel like I fit in. You know, like, I, I'm not in this group. I'm not in that group. I'm left out. And it happens. And it has happened. So the moment we noticed it, I, 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 know, I know it happened within the recent two months. Uh, so, you know, uh, we discussed it and then our youth pastor said, okay, the best thing to do is just address it with everybody. So at one of the uh, uh, meetings, they talked about it openly. They said, hey guys, we are seeing this happen. Is it true or not? And if the youth themselves agree, yeah, it's happening. We know that these people hang together, these people hang out together, others are left out. Uh, so the youth themselves recognized. Hey, this is what's happening amongst us. And then they said, okay, we should not let this happen. We should all mingle together. We should, you know, uh, be welcoming to everybody. So to answer your question, there is a positive side, but our goal must be to encourage people to, uh, to really be a community where everyone is welcome. So especially in a city like Bangalore, uh, we have people from all over India, different states, different cultures, different languages, different uh, customs. But the church must be a community where everybody feels part of it. So uh, we have to consciously move people towards that. Right? Yes, they can be comfortable with some of their own, but when they come together, when we have church events, when we have services, when we're doing things together, we should encourage the mixing and intentionally create activities or uh, you know the, the way they the way we do the service or the event, we should intentionally mix people so that they will make new friends, new people will become will feel comfortable. So that's from our perspective. From the people's perspective, yeah, by default they will go with those who they are comfortable, but we are intentionally moving them to you know to mix and uh, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Pastor. Just to uh, have a follow-up question on that. Um, sure. So, as we mentioned about different uh, language groups as well, like people from different languages are coming. Um, and I just wanted to know, Pastor, like, would the would it be okay if, uh, uh, let's say, I'm considering my example. Um, so we have some uh, very less though, but some Malayalis uh, in our church. Um, uh, but they like to talk in Malayala uh, with me. So would it would it be okay if if me as a uh, as a leader um, talk to them in Malayalam, or should I should I follow the common language? But especially when I talk to them personally, because they find it very comfortable to talk to us in Malayalam. Mm -hmm. um, so should um, so I just wanted to know if it is right to speak to the uh, through the language which they are comfortable especially when we talk in private mm. yeah so my response to that would be if you're talking to them in private yeah by all means use the language that they're comfortable you can speak to them in Malayalam. but when we're talking to them in a group setting like you know maybe in a sunday service you know then always use the common language you know speak in english uh so then people don't feel that you're giving them a special preference. You're, giving them special, you're speaking to only them, you know, you speak. So in a, in a group setting where other people are there, always speak in English, everybody understands. And you're speaking to them privately, personally. Yeah, you can talk to them in Malayalam. They feel comfortable. It's their language. They can express. They can say, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, that's how I would approach that. 
Yes, boss. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we're talking about culture. Uh, how do we, you know, uh, try to establish culture and you know keep that together within the organization or within the church setting? Any questions? Oh yes, but sorry, one more question. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Uh, so, Pastor, in um, in in Manglo culture, I'm just uh, taking this as an example. Uh, so, let's say one group of uh, uh, community they like certain type of meat uh, mm. uh, during their food. Um, food, food. Yeah, and when we uh, when they arrange lunch, um, and they prefer that kind of meat. Like especially when they are, you know, uh, want to celebrate something in the church, they they prefer that kind of meat, uh, and but some other part of India they they don't take that meat. Um, so, would that be okay to to have? Because we've been doing that for quite some time now, because of the culture difference. Uh, some people might not take that meat, but mm -hmm. they 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 will still eat food with all of us. That's not an issue, but. Mm -hmm. uh, should we uh, at any point of time because it's uh, it's regarding food and some culture mm -hmm. I love it some culture does not um, so is there anything that we need to be careful about mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I, I, I know this this is a small thing but yet it is a, it is a very important thing because it's, it's for the congregation um you know I would I would um, I would try to do something that's especially when it's a it's a common setting right like if it's like you're you know in a church setting after service or some event you're having a meal together everybody's there together i would try to create a menu that would be accepted by everybody and uh, if somebody on their own wants to bring a special dish and that dish happens to be something that only few people would eat that is okay but what is uh, you know put forward by the church as part of the meal should be something that is for everyone right? everyone will enjoy it so then what happens is people see that the church is not giving any kind of preferential treatment to any particular group but the, the meal that is provided by the church is for everyone who are part of the congregation. And, uh, you know, it's, if some people prefer a certain kind of dish and they bring it on their own to just say, that, hey, who wants to take it, take it. That's okay. That's okay. That's, that's it. So that's how I would approach it there. Because by doing that, we are communicating that the church is neutral. Okay? That as a congregation, we want to serve everybody equally and at the same time there is freedom for people to enjoy the food of their own taste or their own preference that is okay if they want to come and do it and share it with others that's perfectly fine so that's how i would approach it uh, and i think that um, you know we will not offend anyone or give any preference to anyone by doing that yes but yeah thank you, thank you. Thank you. Interesting questions, but I think these are very practical things that uh, affect the culture of a uh, uh, congregation, community. Yeah. All right. So we will. Um, yeah, I think we have just five more minutes for break, and then uh, all right, let's just see. Um, uh, let's introduce the next section, and then we can go for break. So, I just want to ask to contrast healthy culture and toxic culture. And this is something you just think about, you know, uh, and, and we can say, you know, see, this is healthy, this is not healthy, this is toxic, this is, uh, this will impact, affect people in a negative way, right? So, among leaders, if a leader is consultative that means he's saying let us discuss you know I, i'd like to know everybody what are your thoughts on this that's a good thing and that's a healthy thing that 
gives people an opportunity to share ideas. Whereas if it is dictatorial, uh, very unilaterally located, only one-sided, do what I say, that's dictatorial. That that is that that will that will result in a toxic culture. If a leader is encouraging, supportive, versus uh, uh, abusive, overpowering, suppressive. So no, you have to follow what I say. I am in charge. That is that will result in a very toxic. And uh, if a leader encourages teamwork, and let us do it as a team. You know, uh, why don't five of you get together and do it. Uh, that is a healthy culture. If the leader is, the leader themselves is creating competition between people, let me put this person against the other, then it is going to become a toxic thing because now people are going to compete with each other. The leader is making them compete with each other. That is not good. If the leader is direct and straightforward. That means you say what you have to say, but say it nicely, say it lovingly. You don't mince words, don't, you know, say something people don't understand. Or say directly, this is right, this is wrong. Uh, this is truth, this is not truth. So we're direct, we're straightforward, but we speak the truth in love. Uh, whereas the leader is manipulated, uh, you know, just trying to control people, there is, um, that's very toxic. Freedom versus controlling. Transparent versus being secretive, sharing success versus, you know, it's about me, I am the brand. Uh, we did it together, it's about all of us versus it's all because of me. Fairness, that is, everybody's rewarded based on what they're actually doing versus entitlement. I deserve this, you know. Accountability, the leader is also answerable to others versus autocratic. I'm not answerable to anybody. That will create a toxic culture. Uh, we celebrate each one's strengths. And if the leader recognizes that there are a lot of people around him, and each one has certain sets of strengths, uh, which God has given. You know? So the leader doesn't have all everything. Other people around them have those strengths. But the leader says, I have everything. I know I'm better. That's going to create very toxic culture. Uh, the leader walks in mutual submission, right? He also follows the same rules that everybody else follows. Or if the leader says the rules of everybody else, not for me, it's going to re result in a toxic culture. And same thing about the staff. People feel, you know, I, I will give my best. But if people say, no, I just need to hold on to a job, that's a toxic culture. People want to do excellent work. Versus, I just do nine to five. Tip you feel like we must succeed. Versus, I just do my job. I don't care what happens. So that this is this this kind of thing among the staff will be you know a bad poor health. Let's pause here. We we'll go for a break. We'll come back in five minutes and then sorry ten minutes and then uh, we'll we'll discuss further. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go for a break.